So an American got shot in Cebu City in the Philippines. Is the Philippines safe? So up front, yes, the Philippines is safe. It's a safe country to travel to. There are many countries around the globe that are much more dangerous than the Philippines, I promise you. One that I can think of right off the top of my head. Uh, the United States of America. Welcome to today's video, folks. Apparently, uh... A gentleman was shot and later succumbed to his wounds in Cebu City, I don't know, a couple days ago. I didn't even know about it until you guys brought it up in the comments on yesterday or the day before show. Uh, that's how out of the loop I am. I'm not in the Philippines right now. <clears throat> but anyhow, you guys told me about it. So I uh, just looked at the thumbnails and... Looked at the case for probably all of less than 10 minutes. But I'm going to discuss a broad range of topics today. But I just want to clear that up up front. Folks, is the Philippines safe for you to take your family and go visit? Absolutely, yes. Don't let one incident with a tourist who happens to be from America uh, ruin your vacation plans. And that's another purpose of, <clears throat> of doing this video. Uh, let, let me say that up front. I usually don't jump on the bandwagon when when news happens like this because, hey, it's life. It's everyday life. It doesn't excite me, right? Uh, how does that affect me? How does that, you know, uh, affect my kids? Well, situations like this actually indirectly do because it can affect the perception of travelers, you know, searching for vacation spots, and it can potentially impact tourism, get people all scared up. Next thing you know, the fucking State Department does a... Uh, you know, oh, warning, level, whatever, blah, 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 to try to scare you into not traveling. So when places inadvertently, no fault of their own, you know, catch some type of negative publicity, it can affect the paychecks of all these people working in the tourism industry trying to make a living. And so I'm here to, to defend the reputation, all right? Is the Philippines perfect? Absolutely not. Is it safe to take you and your, your spouse or your boyfriend, girlfriend, and your kids to go visit? Absolutely. Okay? Just stay away from them southern little islands right there. Uh, what's it called? YOLO. Uh, anyhow. The Philippines is fine. I live there with my kids living there. So do you think I would live in a place that's, that's not safe on a certain level to where you have to cancel your vacation plans and not go there? No. It's safe. Continue with your vacation. Just because one one tourist uh, got into an altercation and got shot, that's no reason to uh, cancel your vacation. So I want to clear that up up front. Why I'm doing the video, because the media just jumps on and piles on, right? Especially when there's an American involved. Anywhere in the world, when an American gets shot or gets killed on vacation, oh my gosh, now it's national news, makes international news. You know, meanwhile, three, four locals got killed the, the, the previous month. Nobody gives a shit about them, right? A little bit of imperialism still going on, but hey, that's what sells newspapers, as we used to say. That's what gets clicks. Okay, so let me just start out with some stats to back up what I'm saying. When you leave America, you're actually leaving the danger zone. That's the way I feel. Gun violence. Last year, I think 2023, now look, I tried to get these stats, and they're like not really clear, they're like ambiguous. If you go to this website, government website, it says this, the journalists say this. So I'm just, <laughs> this is probably not an exact accurate stat, but you go to several sources, it says uh, approximately 43,000 people were affected by gun violence last year. Uh... 56% was suicide, 35% was homicide, and 3% got smoked by cops, about 1,438 people, uh, and, and you know what, I, I didn't even clarify, is that just the people, no, I, that's got to be deaths, I'll have to, you know what, boom, I'll put it on the screen, 43,000 people, I think, dead from gun violence, yeah, that's, that's accurate, folks, I don't take good notes, right, plus I'm drinking beer. Uh, for every death to survive, so one in three people in America that get shot, they die. Um, that's just the way it is. In America, 
you know, I used to be a cop of various sorts. Basically, I was a narcotics agent. If you don't know that about me, don't hold that against me because that's in my past life. Uh, a lot of things I have different feelings on now. But used to be a cop, used to be a narcotics agent. In America, I guess since I was uh, a teenager, I never went anywhere without carrying a gun. If I moved back to America, I would go back to carrying a gun. Because I refused to be a victim. But when I left America, I sold all my guns. I moved over here to Thailand. I've been living, you know, between, uh, since the lockdown, between the Philippines. Well, I lived through the lockdown in the Philippines. But over here in Southeast Asia, nowhere I've ever been, that includes Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, in this region, I've never felt the need to carry a gun. I've never felt the need to be armed. So let's talk about the Philippines. I've never felt the need to be armed in the Philippines. Now, do you think I would live in a country with my background uh, and absolute refusing to be a victim of violent crime? You think I'd live somewhere where I couldn't carry a gun? You know, foreigners, it's you can't do it. No, I never felt the need to. Why? Because it's inherently safe compared to my home country of the United States. Is there crime? Yeah. yeah. I lost a big old bag of shoes. Do you think I got it back? No. Because of the poverty. You lose your wallet, you're not getting that wallet back. If you do, it ain't going to have no cash in it because of the poverty. But just because people are poor and just because there's poverty doesn't always directly equate to violence. So, uh, anyhow, with all that said... I made some notes here. I don't write a script. So everything that's coming out of this mouth is going from brain to mouth to camera through the internet to you on this video. So I've got like some rudimentary notes that I scribbled in chicken scratch. But uh, let, let's just move right along. Let's dissect the situation. Now, here comes some more disclaimers. And folks, if you've never watched one of my videos, I don't tell a story quickly. I can't tell a story quickly. I'm not in a hurry. I'm sitting here going to drink me a cold beer. And I'm just going to have a talk. So I recommend you get you a beer. Chill out. I think the audio is great in this setup here. I'm broadcasting from the little... It's my TV room, but I call it the studio here at my ranch. So the audio is going to be good. The scenery is not going to change. So really just go about what you're doing and listen to the video. It's really a podcast. The elements of this case in my 10 minutes of Google slash YouTube research. The disclaimer. Folks, especially coming from the West, coming from America, everybody's innocent until they're proven guilty in a court of law. People should not be tried in the media or on social, on social media or on YouTube or anything else. But guess what? This is the current state of affairs of the world. People are tried. Uh, online and social media just like before the internet they were tried in the media in newspapers right perception is reality they say but the suspect in this case still has his day in court he's you know he's, he's uh, gonna go through the due process of the Philippines and, and see what happens but I am gonna offer my opinion to try to push back against the negative publicity that this this incident is going to create and I'm going to invoke thought and I'm going to ask you what would you do at the end of this video what what would you do if you're sitting in that car when this shit went down so basic elements of the case that I saw on the CCTV and that I read which probably 60% of what I'm about to say is skewed because it's coming secondhand from the media. Well, the CCTV is straight, but supposedly they were in a bar. This American guy, uh, there's a group of locals, one happens to be a famous rapper, and allegedly the American guy was, I don't know, grabbing the girl's ass, saying some inappropriate things. It sounds like he was being a drunk jackass in the bar. Now, I'm making the assumption that he was drinking, but that's a pretty safe assumption that you're in a bar, you're acting a jackass. You probably had too much to drink, right? At some point, uh, the suspect and 
the gentleman who got shot, they separate, right? The video, the only part I saw is the gentleman standing outside, and then the car is approaching with the suspect. So they're, 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 they, there's a period of time where they're apart. And as the car pulls up, somebody sucker kicks him from behind. Okay? Now, let me back up and say the first time I saw a picture of this guy, I said right then, that guy's an MMA fighter. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to deduce that. But I've been training Muay Thai. I haven't in a couple years since the lockdown. But I trained Muay Thai for several years. And uh, living here in Thailand, you can recognize these dudes from a mile out. You know, it's, it's the MMA uniform. Real short shorts, you know, uh, tank top or muscle shirt, tattoos up and down, right? It's, it's like they all wear a uniform because they're peacocking. They want you to know, hey, I'm a fighter, right? And I understand it, the tattoos and all that. and You know, it goes into the psychology of when you're about to fight a guy, right? You're peacocking. You're saying, hey, man, I got more tattoos than you. I can take more pain than you. Not here to debate tattoos. But the point is... I looked at this guy for a flash and said, that's an MMA fighter. He's wearing the uniform. It's pretty fucking obvious, right? If he's not, he's doing a damn good job of perpetrating the fraud that he's an MMA fighter. Which equates to me, in my mind, this guy is an elevated threat. Why? Because he's a fucking MMA fighter. Alright, he's not some 400 pound dude sitting on a bar stool that can't even run over here. He, you know, he, he could run 20 feet before he passed out. So anyhow, back to uh, the facts. There is uh, some melee around the car. It appears, appears that the American guy goes over to the car. Now before he does that, he does these little bunny hops, right? In other words, he's getting into fight mode. I know the feeling. And if you've ever been a fighter, you know what he's doing. He, he's like amping up, getting ready for the fight. He's getting the blood pumping. He, he's in fight mode. What are they, what's the old saying? If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's a lot of guys' problems. Not everybody, but some people's problems when they get into the fight game. They just, you know, get a couple drinks in them and every, everything looks like a nail and they're a hammer. So I see the guy doing the, doing the bunny hop. He's over there. I don't know if he opened the door or the Kuya opened the door. But at some point, there's an altercation and it looks like he dropped him right there. Again, I am admitting that I don't know all the facts. I may have that totally fucked up because I did 10 minutes of research. And again, all the facts and everything will be, it'll it'll come out in the trial or or the legal process. I'll just say that. Uh, Apparently, the suspect admitted that he shot the guy. So there's no question. You got a video and you got the guy saying, yeah, I shot the guy. Um... And I think it, it, it was a 45 caliber handgun that shot him. I think the dude got hit twice and uh, later succumbed to his injuries. I think once in the chest, maybe once in the leg. Anyhow, my heart goes out to his family. It really does. Um, you know, in situations like this, the true victims are his family. If he has kids, man, I'm hurting for for his family. Um And if you want to say a prayer for anybody, you pray for his family. I don't feel sorry for him because I'm a true believer that you're the captain of your own destiny. And he steered him. He steered himself to that destiny. So uh, if I'm going to pray for anybody, I'm praying for his family. And uh, my God, if he has kids. Uh, Anyhow, moving right along. So that's the basic elements of the case. So the guy's in custody. Um, It's making the rounds on the news. American gets shot in Cebu, right? And it'll it'll make national news. It'll make news in the States. And it's a great tragedy because an American got shot in a foreign country. Meanwhile, as I have already talked to this camera for what? What's the time? 15 minutes? How many people already got shot in America while I've been talking to this camera? When probably zero people have been shot in the Philippines in the 15 minutes that I've been talking to this camera. Now somebody can do the math, but if there's 43,000 gun deaths, uh, (laughs) do the math. There's a very good chance that people have been shot and killed in America during the time that I've kicked off this video. 
Okay, um, all right, so let's break down where this gentleman went wrong. Let's break down uh, how he could have prevented getting himself into this situation. I'm going to tell my story about where I got knocked out, running my mouth at a bar. So I'm not casting stones uh, at, at everything I'm going to say. I'm speaking from experience because that situation could have easily been me several years ago on, on one incident. Luckily, I just got knocked out. I'm going to tell that story, so don't go nowhere. But I need a second to drink some of this cold beer. That beer seems so delicious. The ladies, my ladies out there, if you're going to make your man a beer, if he calls for a beer, you put it in the freezer for about 7 to 10 minutes. Don't let it freeze. And then serve it up with that extra coal. That's what I just did. I put it in the freezer for, I don't know, probably about 6 minutes, brought that temperature down. It's appropriate temperature for beer drinking. Okay, so now we're going to shift over. We're going to shift over to uh, how this gentleman could have avoided this. And this is travel safety, travel survival for any of my young bachelors out there or my older bachelors that are going to go out to a place like Southeast Asia or Central America or Colombia or anywhere you're going to go and chase ladies because you can't find any ladies in America because most ladies in America ain't looking for dudes anymore, it seems to me. <laughs> from what y'all keep telling me, right? So, where he went wrong, step number one, and you're going to have to follow me here, because this would be hypocritical. Oh, you're saying don't go to a bar. Step one, number one, the gentleman was in a bar, okay? You ever watch that Yellowstone episode where uh, the older black guy who was the day worker, they're all going down, down to the bar, and they said, hey, you want to go? And he said, hell no. Nothing good ever happens at a bar. I never forgot that because there's so much truth to that. Why? Because you put a bunch of people in a bar where 80% are drunk and then all of a sudden the snakes in their heads start coming out and the, the alter egos, the dudes who want to fight. A lot of good things do happen in a bar. I mean, goddamn, how many times, you know, how many hundreds of times have I pulled one night stands out of bars? That was my game. Hit Cowboys or uh, Wild Bills. And uh, before the night was out, some girl was going home with me. But the difference was, I wasn't there to fight. I was there to get a piece of ass. That was my mission. Anything else that interfered with that mission, uh, I'm not interested in. Okay? But I had a good buddy, and I'm not going to say his name. I'll change his name in case some of y'all from back in the day are watching. <laughs> But when we rolled out, out as a crew, we had a dude among our group who, as soon as he would start drinking, you know, he'd bow up with somebody or, hey, you looking at me, whatever. And he'd always wear a button-up shirt like this with a white tank top underneath, you know, what we call a wife beater, just a white tank top. And he was a big dude. I mean, he's six foot. I mean, he's a football player. I mean, he's a scary dude, right? I, I wouldn't want to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. It'd be like fighting a fucking grizzly bear. And it sucked because this was the one out of the group that always wanted to fight somebody. Now, well, say we have five or six people, right? Somebody had to be assigned to stay next to him the whole night to make sure he didn't get in a fight. But it was very easy to spot. He'd look over here. He would look over, be like that. You know, what are you looking at? Half the time, the guy he's going to fight don't even know he's talking to him. But what's he doing? He's unbuttoning the shirt, right? And it'd take him, you know, take him a minute to get that shirt unbuttoned and untuck, whatever. And, and, and he'd go to pulling that fucking shirt off. Well, when he started unbuttoning the shirt, the guy standing next to him knew that, that you know, he's turning into this crazy man trying to fight somebody. So then you could be like signaling all the rest of the crew, hey, 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 check him out. He's unbuttoning the shirt. Even if you were on the far side of the club, if you looked over and saw that dude wearing a white white wife beater where, you know, 10 minutes before he's wearing a nice polo, looks like a respectable guy, you know that he's in fucking chaos, madman mood, 
and all five or six of us would converge on this motherfucker and be like, hey, man, put your fucking shirt back on, dude. Hey, hey, stop that shit. Put your shirt back on. And as long as you could get him to put that polo back on and get that damn thing buttoned back up, he would calm down because he didn't want to tear up his polo. <laughs> you can't make this shit up, right? And so this guy was saved from himself so many times. Why? Because he rolled out with a posse that knew him, that knew what he had tried to pull in the past and could prevent him from doing any stupid shit. Had that, had our buddy rolled out on his own, well, maybe his personality changes, but if he had pulled that shit on his own, he would have ended up, you know, in the jail cell for fighting out on the dance floor. But he rolled with the posse, he rolled with us, we had his back because he's our buddy, and when you knew when that somebody started unbuttoning that fucking polo, you know, oh shit, here we go again. You know, and everybody had just come in there as a mob, put your shirt back on, man. It all had to do with that shirt. <laughs> uh, that was some good times back then, man. Uh, if you guys are watching, man, I ain't for, I, 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 it's like it was yesterday. Just Anyhow, so step number one, back to this incident, the dude there where he was wrong. Number one, he's in a bar, okay, where everybody's drinking. And it appeared to me that he was alone. Now, I don't know that for a fact. He's at some Right before the incident happens, he's standing outside with a dude with his arm around him. I don't know if that's his friend or security or, or who it was. Maybe he did roll with the local. Or he was by himself. But let me just make this argument. When you roll out to a club where there's going to be some drinking going on, roll with a coalition. Okay, pull the fucking George Bush. You don't roll out by yourself, especially if you, when you start drinking, you're the personality that you have liquid courage and you want to fight. All right, now, obviously, this guy is an MMA fighter, and it seems to me that he's one of those that, that's a hammer, that thinks everything's a nail. Now, he's probably the nicest guy when he's not drinking. But some people, I mean, hell, look at all these fighters and different, you know, UFC fighters that get, get themselves in trouble or whatever. There's always alcohol involved, and next thing you know, they're wanting to fight somebody, right? So, he's in a bar, he's drinking, and number three, he has no or ineffective local backup. Okay? Now, think about this. If the guy roll with one one little skinny local guy, is that little skinny local guy going to be able to control him or to manhandle him if he gets out of line? No, that's ineffective backup. Uh, if I had rolled with my buddy who's six foot and he starts taking off that shirt and I can't talk him down, do you think I'm going to be able to restrain him before he goes and gets himself into trouble? No, but guess who can? Six grown men. Six grown men on one dude, even he's six foot, he's going down, all right? He's, we're not going to let him get himself into trouble. It's it's like, you know, I, like I said, it used to be a cop, right? You you roll up on a guy. I got a perfect video. Maybe I'll play it one day. Roll up on a dude who's disorderly, big, huge brother, like six foot two, big belly, wearing a fucking, wearing nothing but a, a bathrobe, holding a damn cordless phone. He wasn't nowhere near the house. When I rolled up, I said, holy shit, this dude, this dude is going to be a handful. So what did I do? I talked to him like a little bitch for about 20 minutes. Well, I went 20, say 10 minutes. Until when? Until backup got there. Because if I go one-on-one -on -one with this guy, it's not going to end well for either one of us. Once backup gets there, now, it's, now it goes from talking nice to, hey, man, you know, turn around. Now you're under arrest. You got to go. And he's going to go. And if two, two people can't get him, you know what's the old saying? You can outrun the motor, but you can't outrun Motorola. We're going to, you're going. It don't matter. We just keep piling people on until you go. So this guy went out with either no or ineffective local backup to where if he got out of line in this club, if there were six Kuyas there, they're just going to wrestle his ass into a trike or a cab and get them under control and get them out of there. Or if there's any other people wanting to fight, there's six people in his group. Who's going to engage them, right? Hey, man, it's our buddy. He's drunk. Sorry. 
They talk local to local. They diffuse the situation. So, if you're going to go out to a bar, it's always better to roll with the coalition, no matter where you're at. No matter if you're at Cowboys in Kennesaw, Georgia, or Wild Bills, you know, over in Gwinnett County, or if you're in a fucking bar in the middle of the Philippines, or Thailand, or Colombia, if you roll with a coalition who have your back, you know, incidents like this can be avoided most of the time. Okay? Okay, now the allegations were that... From what I read, that he was in there grabbing girls' ass, talking bad to the ladies, and they happened to be friends of of the shooter. That's not good. That's not good. But again, if that had happened, the group could have either prevented him from doing this shit or drug his ass out of there, took care of himself, or you know, took took care of their own group, right? So somebody else don't have to. Another mistake that the dude made. I think they call that shit peacocking, right? He's peacocking that, hey, I'm Billy Badass. Because he goes into the club wearing these short shorts to show off all his tattoos and his muscles on his legs. He wants everybody to know, hey, I'm Billy Badass. I'm a fighter. You know, got this scraggly ass looking beard. Now look, I'm not telling anybody how to, uh, how to dress or how to cut your hair or if you want to wear a beard. But certain areas of the globe, people have perceptions. Whether or not you have facial hair, right? You go to the Middle East and you don't have a beard, you might be looked upon suspiciously. You go to certain places, you got a big-ass beard, maybe people are scared of you, right? There's People perceive different things. But there's not a whole lot of males in Southeast Asia that are rocking a big-ass beard, right? So here's a dude in there with a, with a, with a big-ass beard, got muscles out to everywhere, tattoos up and down peacocking that I'm Billy Badass well yeah you're scaring people motherfucker because you're wearing the I'm, I'm a you know I'm an MMA fighter uniform that's the uniform that's the peacocking uniform to tell every motherfucker in the world hey I'm a, I'm an MMA fighter even though I'm a club in a club uh, I'm wearing my fucking gym clothes okay that's another lesson too don't wear your fucking gym clothes to a club to a government building such as immigration, okay, not appropriate. Oh, by the way, don't wear your fucking gym clothes on a, on a plane sitting next to me with your balls hanging out, right? So, are, are you seeing how so many things on a level that this jackass did wrong that led up to this incident? Because, let me go back and say, do you think the shooter got dressed and went to the club with his lady friends... And thought to himself, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smoke a white guy tonight. You think that was his intent? That was nowhere in that dude's mind when he stepped out that night to go out to this club and hang out with them ladies. Nowhere in his mind to do this. But this, this gentleman set the conditions for this train wreck to happen. Okay. Then, they're outside, right? They're outside, uh, the car pulls up, but when the car pulls up, nobody gets out. It's not like the car pulled up and eight dudes jumped out and jumped on this dude, start beating his ass. Now, there was a sucker kick that come out of the, uh, you know, come off the top ropes and kicked him. So, the guy that kicks him, I don't know why he didn't turn around and engage this guy. I don't know all the facts. But you can see him bounce up and down. He's ready, he's in fight mode. When he should have been in flight mode. Okay? It is perfectly okay that when something goes down and you are at the disadvantage to get off the X. That matter of fact, that's exactly what you do. It has nothing to do with pride or can I whip this guy or can I take this guy or whatever. When you are outnumbered, you don't fucking try to pull a Jack Reacher, especially somewhere that's not your home country and you're not even speaking the goddamn language. Okay? You get off the fucking X and you live to fight another day. Okay? I'm going to tell you exactly what I would have done. If I found myself in that situation where I'm standing outside a club, a fucking car pulls up, I don't know what the hell's going on, 
All of a sudden, I get sucker kicked from the fucking back. And he pushes me that way. I'm still running. Good luck catching me, motherfuckers. Because I'm not going fist to fist with an unknown number of people at a fucking bar. Not knowing if they're armed. You assume they're armed. You assume they got guns. They're locals. You're a fucking tourist. You didn't bring a gun. You just got off the airplane. How fucking stupid can you be? You don't fucking pop up and get ready to fight everybody. You've been watching too many Jack Reacher movies. Just bullshit. Absolute bullshit. You get off the fucking X. And you laugh about it the next day when you sober up. And you tell a story with fucking pride. Like, man, I don't know what the fuck happened. I don't know what the, what the hell I said to piss them off, but... All I know is fucking Hong Kong fool. He came off the fucking top ropes, put me on the deck. I look up, there's six fucking Kuyas, and I said, good luck catching me, motherfuckers. And I was running faster than Carl Lewis and O.J. Simpson put together, and all I see, all I see is some dudes back there in the dust. I don't know what happened. That's the fucking story I would tell while I'm drinking me a beer the next morning trying to clear my head and figure out why my back hurts. All right, so going on the offensive against a group of locals, boom, he's just ratcheting up these conditions. You know that show, uh, what's it called, Disaster, all these disaster shows, right, Mayday, Mayday, Disaster, there's always a series of events that lead up to that disaster, where if you break any of those links in that chain, that disaster would not have happened. It's like a perfect storm of events lining up. And this jackass here, in my mind, is lining everything up perfectly for somebody to pull out a fucking gun and, and cap his ass. He has to bear some responsibility. There's so many times he could have, uh, in, in my mind, so many things he could have done different. For example, what if you put on some jeans and a long sleeve shirt and look presentable when you went to that fucking club? Maybe this wouldn't have happened. Maybe they would have had more respect for you. Maybe not been so frightened by you with you know all these fucking prison looking tattoos and I'm a badass. Maybe just that. Just maybe your appearance could have changed everybody's perception. And maybe they looked at you instead of saying, that's a drunk asshole. Maybe they said, oh, this dude's having a bad day. I used to teach this. It has to do with insurgency and counterinsurgency. You got to make it hard for people to hate you. Make it hard for them to hate you to the point they dig a hole in the ground and put a bomb in the road. But if you make it easy for them to hate you, motherfuckers out there with shovels, no remorse, no second thoughts about it. So think about that next time you go out to the club wearing your fucking gym clothes, flying your tats. Alright? All you're doing is amping people up. Uh, now, this is where it comes down to it. And I guess I'll tell this part of the story. They don't want me on the jury of this case. Because unless there's something that, that, that really skews the facts where this was premeditated, they go back with a you know, big argument over the past six months over an ex-girlfriend, or they sharing a girl. Unless there's something that totally changes the flow of this story, they don't want me on the jury. Because, and I'll tell you this, if this, if this case were tried in America... You don't even got to have Johnny Cochran to get this, this shooter off in, in a self-defense claim. Why? Because Billy Badass, who looks like a scary individual, who any juror will look at him and say, yeah, that's a, that's a professional fighter, appears to go over to this guy's car and either open the door or physical, let's just say physical confrontation while the dude is sitting or exiting his vehicle. To me, that's a fucking carjacking. That's almost a fucking carjacking. If not, it's the castle doctrine. Now, I'm not a lawyer. I haven't been in law enforcement. I don't know what the laws and, and, and what's going on today. I don't know all the laws, right? All I can tell you is that if I'm sitting in my fucking car, because maybe it wasn't this guy's intent to ever engage this guy. It just like, looks like he drove up. Maybe he's waiting on some girls to get in the fucking back seat. Next thing you know, I got this professional fighter trying to rip me out or opens the door to my car 
or tries to do violence while I'm sitting in the driver's seat, I'm going to defend myself with extreme prejudice. Let's just use those words where this video don't get banned. If I'm in my vehicle in America and you open that fucking door without my permission and put hands on me, I'm going to defend myself 100%. Whoever tries that shit with me, I'm going to defend myself. That's all I'm going to say. And in America, I can legally carry a weapon and I fear for my safety and I'm going to defend myself and I refuse to be a victim. What's the old saying? Much better to be judged by 12 than carried by 6. Try to carjack a guy like me in America and I'm sure many of you feel the same way. You're not going to carjack me. It's, uh, it's the same with coming in my house. You come in my house, fucking burglar or... You know, some type of home invasion? What's the old saying? You're going you're gonna to show up fucking vertical, but you're going to leave horizontal. So that's the problem that Billy Badass has. If he were in an American courtroom, this, this guy's getting off. Or he might not, not even get charged. Because Billy Badass went over there, this dude's in the driver's seat, in, in control of that vehicle. I got a big problem with that. With him going over to the vehicle. If he had just got kicked in the back. And stood around. And the guy got out and shot him. Okay. That's fucking murder. But Billy Badass appears to go over to the side of that car. And either open the door. Or engage. Let's say he engaged or attempted to engage with the driver of the vehicle. That's a problem. It's all about how the victim perceives the actions. It's not about us watching CCTV and knowing the whole story. It's about how a victim perceives what happened to them. I'm sitting in the car. I look over. This fucking professional fighter is coming over to open that door. How do I know he's not going to come over and try to break my fucking neck? Going to meet Mr. Pistol. So... Maybe I lose a lot of you, and you disagree, but dissent is the ultimate form of patriotism. If you disagree with me, and if I'm getting the facts wrong, leave the shit down below, okay? And that's the power of having the right to uh, due process, right? The jurors will get to figure this out, or the judge will get to figure this out. But I'm going to tell you right now, tell you another secret. I just got a subpoena to, uh, not a subpoena, I just got jury duty. You know, in uh, 12, 13 years. Well, it's been longer than that. But I, I've been out of America for over a decade. Never got a jury duty summons until now. Just came in the mail. So it wasn't like it was served properly. Just came in the mail. But I acknowledge, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be in jury duty next month. So i got to put the call in and let them know, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> got a little situation. I don't, I don't live, I'm, I'm a few thousand kilometers away from there. So what can we do? But in my younger years, you, you think that the law is rigid, that it's a box. And that's what the pros prosecutors want you to think, that it's a box. They tell you what you have to do. And when you're a rookie cop, they tell you what you have to do, and you follow it because you don't realize that as you get older, there's better ways to handle situations. And certain situations, you do have the power to make decisions that don't go along with that fucking box. And a lot of times it's the right decision. So like the prosecutor, you know, tell you, you, you know, if you believe the elements of this crime, it's your duty. You have to convict. And, you know, it's not up to you to decide the sentence or you have to convict. No, I don't. I'm the jury. We're in the jury. That's where the people have the fucking power. Weak-minded individuals on a jury will go along with what the prosecutors tell them to, to do sometimes because they're scared. But they don't want me on a jury. Because in this case right here, I don't care what the elements of the law say. I'm not convicting the dude. I'm not convicting the shooter. Because there's no way you're going to convince me that when he left to go to that club, it was his intent to shoot that dude. 
I may lose some of you, but that's my feelings about it. The deceased set the conditions for this train wreck. It's just one man's opinion. So, I'm going to tell you my story. Uh, statute of limitations, I'm sure I've ran out about a decade ago. I'm drunk in a bar in Southeast Asia. Okay. For whatever reason, I'd had too much to drink. There was a little party going on. There were some locals there. It's just a little small bar. But it had some free food, uh, uh, DJ, what have you. And I started running my mouth. And my problem was I was running my mouth in the local language. If I had just been running my mouth in English, they probably wouldn't have understood what I said. But I was speaking the local language. And so people understood, the locals understood exactly what I was saying. So this is an example of when knowing the local language is not a good thing. During uh, whatever shit I was saying, at some point I was picking myself off, half off the pavement and half off this little stage. <laughs> Just like a fucking slinky, right? I'm picking myself up. I didn't know what happened at first. Now recently, I heard Francis in, uh, Ngannou make a statement. I guess he boxed somebody and got knocked out. I don't, I don't know. I didn't see the fight, but... He said something, they, they asked him, did it hurt? And he said, no, that's how he knew he got knocked out. He didn't feel no pain. They're like, man, how bad did that hurt? It didn't hurt at all. That's how I knew I got knocked out. Well, that was funny because it just flashed me back to that incident, right? I didn't know I got knocked out. I didn't feel nothing. And, you know, I just got up. I'm like, what the fuck happened? What am I doing here? I had no idea how I got there. You know, my one buddy who I knew, just a drinking buddy, brought me over to the bar, got me a drink. They're trying to tell me to calm down. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm calm. Well, then it started coming back to me. I'm like, wait a minute. Somebody just knocked me the fuck out. That's when I turned into loudmouth mode again. And I wanted to fight. Now, this is before I started going to Muay Thai. Back years ago. What saved me was the dude sucker punched me. I didn't know who hit me. I legitimately could not pick out the guy that hit me. Had no idea. Never saw it coming. Don't know who did it to this day. I mean, I'm just like trying to pick out. I'm trying to get the guy to identify himself, running my mouth. Nobody rogered up. So I go across the street where a local buddy of mine I'd known. Mako, you go home. Police come, you go monkey house. In other words, they're going to put you in jail, man. Shut the fuck up and go home. So thanks to my one buddy picking me up, dusting me off, and thanks to my local buddy insisting and busting my balls and making me go home, that was the end of the incident, and I sit here to tell the story. How could that story have ended for me back then? If I'd known who knocked me out, I would have went over there and gotten a fight. And I probably would have had some problems with the police. What did I talk about in the previous video? You live over here in these countries. Out, you live in any country. Outside your home country is a privilege, not as a right. So you go out and you do stupid shit, you get your visa canceled and you have to go home. Well, you don't got to go home, but you got to get the hell up, up out of whatever country you have problems in. So, I thank my lucky stars that night that I had no idea who knocked me the fuck out. Thank you very much for sucker punching me. Because if you'd have came up and went toe to toe when I came to, we would, we would still be going at it. So thanks for sucker punching me. Thanks to my buddy dusting me off. And, man, I don't even know if you're still around. I heard years ago you had a heart attack, man. Maybe may you rest in peace or maybe you're over on the beach. I don't fucking know. But thank you. And to my, my local buddy, thank you very much for busting my balls to the point that I did go home. You know? And that's the end of the story. It's a great story. You know, it's a legendary story. You know, what's a legend? You, get, you do something stupid and wait 10 years. And it becomes legend could have easily happened to me i could have got my visa canceled or this dude could have pulled out a gat or his buddy could have pulled out a gat why i'm at a bar i'm drunk and you know what i was wearing a pair of shorts and a fucking tank top and a wife beater matter of fact uh i had no effective local backup i just had one drinking buddy and one local guy across the street maybe if i had five or six dudes they would have calmed me down long before i got sucker punched 
Uh, peacock and I was a badass. Not really I was a badass, just Peacock and I looked like a dirtbag. Wearing the equivalent of a bathing suit and a tank top with my balls hanging out, running my mouth. See, going on the offensive, big mistake. But luckily, again, I didn't know who to fucking hit. <laughs> and I'm not, folks, I'm not a violent dude. I don't get in fights. When I go to bars, I'm looking for girls. But this just, uh, and I wasn't looking for a fight. I was just running my mouth. The fight came to me. You know, running that flapper in a bar, that's a, that's a, that's a sucker punch magnet. No, there wasn't no vehicle. Uh, no vehicle involved. Anyhow. So, is there a double standard when it comes to incidents, especially in regions like this? Absolutely. Uh, foreigner injures or harms or kills a local, it's detrimental. They're going to come after you with all their might. If a local kills a foreigner, they're not coming with you with all their might unless there's pressure from... Such as, you know, the U.S. Embassy has a lot of visibility and there's there's backdoor fucking conversations about it, right? So, had it been the other way around, this American guy hurt the shooter, he'd never get out of prison. He'd be like Joseph Scott Pemberton, the uh, U.S. Marine, Neo Marine, who uh, killed the lady boy over in uh, Longapo. You heard that fucker's name on the radio, the TV. You could not turn on the radio or get in a taxi for that whole saga without hearing the name Joseph Scott Pemberton. It's a nationwide outrage over him killing a lady boy. But if you ask any of the taxi drivers in Manila, they say, I'd have, I'd have done the same thing. So, not to get too deep into that story, only to explain to you that as a world traveler, or if you're going to live in a country that's not your own, you have to be on good behavior because the ramifications towards you can and will be much worse than the ramifications versus a local. Does that make sense? Uh, so anyhow, you know, here in Thailand, there's been a rash of incidents where foreigners uh, behaving badly. It's like permeating the news right now. Just Foreigners doing stupid shit, right? Getting themselves into trouble. But it's the topic of the moment. Okay. Let's see. What else do I need to talk about here? Talked about... Uh, again, folks, I don't... I don't have... Uh, I don't write a script. I don't write a script. So when I sit here and I look at these notes, I'm trying to just decipher chicken scratch... Let's see. Anyhow, I think that's the I think that's the end of the notes. What's the moral of the story? If you're going bar hopping, try to roll with the coalition. Maybe dress a little bit nicer. Uh, don't 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 go in there dressed like a fighter. And you know, here here's the thing: how that affects certain people right when they're in the fight game and maybe it just has to do with being younger maybe it has to do you know maybe people are doing some people are doing some fucking roids that fucks up their mind whatever i've never been the type of guy to look for a fight luckily i am the type of guy when i get drunk in a bar i run my mouth but i'm a short guy people just laugh i'm not a threat they just mostly just laugh it off this guy here nobody was laughing they were scared of him that's my opinion um, so I'm not saying don't go to a bar. I'm not, I'm not telling you don't go to a bar, but there's just things that you need to do that you can try to do to be smart about it where it doesn't come to this. And it's pretty simple. You can pay trike drivers, all right? Let me give you some solutions. Well, you're just talking about the problems. You're not giving me any solutions. If, if you roll to a place like Angeles City by yourself, just offer a trike driver some money to go around with you and, and uh, go bar hopping with you. And just tell them, hey, man, I'm going to do some drinking. If I get out of line, you know, you and the bouncers load me up, take me back to my hotel, man. Keep me out of trouble. I'm going to pay you. 
you know, pay the guy a thousand pesos for three, four hours or whatever, whatever you got to pay him. That's 20 bucks. That's pennies on the dollar compared to either going to jail or running up a big ass bar tab or, you know, getting, getting your ass beat. It's real simple. Okay. You don't want to hire a trike driver? Go into a bar and, and, and bar find a couple big heavy set waitresses. And just tell the mom son, hey, I want, I, want, I want these two ladies to go around with me all night. Make sure I stay out of trouble. So if you roll with two older Filipinas that are kind of heavy set that can manhandle your ass, they'll keep you out of trouble. Now, if you go get a couple 20-year-old skinny minis, they're not too good at manhandling people. And they run away and play Facebook if anything goes, goes wrong. So that's why you got to get like some older waitress types, right? Some older, you know, like Amazon type chicks. Uh... And have them go around with you. So even if you go to Padilla, you go to Angeles City, you go to Medellin, Colombia by yourself, it's pennies on the dollar to hire your own little entourage. Especially if you're only there for three, four, five days. My God, from what I hear what's going on in Colombia, how they're drugging everybody, there's no way in hell I go to a club by myself in Colombia. It's just like, like, like so commonplace. How do, you, how do you mitigate that? You roll with the coalition. If you're paying the coalition, you know, that's their job to take care of you. They know where to take you back to. So there's a huge solution right there to prevent this. Give you another example. My buddy Pablo. May you rest in peace, brother. When Pablo put boots on the ground for seven days, ten days, five days, fourteen days, wherever we went to, but I'll use Angeles City for example. He went to this one little bar, and we were friends with the bar owner, the lady, and he would bar find the entire bar for his entire trip. If it was her and six chicks sitting in, up in there, they all packed their bags, she put a padlock on the door, and stayed with Pablo for 10 days. Everywhere he went, he had six girls and a mama sign with him. Now, he was hammered drunk wherever he went, and he would stay, say stupid shit at times, but you know what? He had a coalition of ladies that kept him out of trouble, that drug his ass this way, this way, fed him, went and got his food, kept him from uh, doing anything stupid, like grabbing some girl's ass in a club or saying something inappropriate. So, so many other paths and options And, and plans and just little things that can be implemented to prevent something like this. And I think we'll all agree that one of the worst things you can do, especially to poor people, this has nothing to do with the Philippines. The worst thing you can do to poor people is insult their women. I think that's true anywhere. Because I'm going to tell you what will happen to this dude if we're in a bar in the backwoods of Mississippi and I'm in there with my girlfriend or my wife and my two cousins and some jackass comes in there and grabs one of their asses. It's, it's not going to end well for them. It applies anywhere. The worst thing you can do to poor people, don't talk bad about their women. Don't talk bad about their mama. Damn sure don't talk bad about their truck. Or are you going to get in a fight? So really, does this incident have anything to do with the Philippines? Or Filipino culture? Or locals versus foreigners? Nope. Absolutely nothing. It has absolutely nothing to do with a clash of culture. Uh... The geographic location. Because if that same shit had happened in a parking lot of a bar in the backwoods of Mississippi. Dude still would have got smoked. Think about it. You're that redneck and that dude opens up the door to your truck trying to punch you in the face. Or you're trying to get out and he tries to punch you in the face. I'm just saying. So in this case, folks, uh, for me, it's a non-issue. 
It's a non-fucking issue that has to do with uh, with the Philippines. It's it boils down to a drunk asshole got shot, and it looks like it's almost self-defense. Boom! There you go. Might not be your opinion. I don't know what anybody else is saying. Like I said, I watched 10 minutes of uh, the media coverage in Tagalog. I don't know what the fuck they're saying about it. Maybe I'm way off. Maybe I'm the total dissenting opinion. Maybe this was a drug deal going bad. I have no fucking clue. But if I save one motherfucker, and I I use that term lovingly, okay? If I save one of you from having any problems while you're traveling, especially if you're a first-timer, then it's worth me doing this video. There you go. So again, Philippines is safe. You go to a bar, use some common sense. You don't got any friends. Hire you a local entourage. They'll go for pennies on the dollar. Or hell, some of them girls will go with you if you just have, well, you know, come have a couple drinks with me, keep me out of trouble, I'll buy you some jelly bee. You can hire your own coalition for pennies on the dollar. Keep your ass out of trouble. All right? Uh... Anyhow, maybe while I'm sitting down putting this thing on the computer, I think of some more points. But please leave your comments down below. Please leave your opinions. Please leave the facts. Whatever you got to say about the incident. But again, is the Philippines safe? Come on, absolutely. My gosh. All right. The dangerous thing about going to the Philippines is probably like, you know, driving through your downtown area on the way to the fucking airport. If you don't get robbed in the parking garage at the airport and you get to the plane, okay, it's probably the safest safest part of your trip is going to the Philippines and coming back. <laughs> and then then when you get back in your car in the parking garage, put a round back in the chamber of your Glock and then continue on the roads of America. Continue on with your life. The State Department won't tell you this shit. They'll probably put some bullshit on their website. Unsafe to go to Cebu City. Folks, if you believe anything the State Department tells you, you'd never leave your uh, your living room. So, anyhow. Thank you very much for listening to my video, listening to my talk, and I will see you guys on the next one. And, uh, again, I pray for everybody that's involved with this Uh Pray for everybody, both sides. But I got no love lost for the deceased himself. You captain, captain of your own destiny. It's a problem with America. We stop taking responsibility for our actions. Reap what you sow. One more that comes to mind, I might be an asshole. But you, don't, you don't bring your fist to a gunfight. It's fucking sad. <laughs>